the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, you who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, master of life, come dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. Well, we're going to get Pentecost Sunday ready uh, now. The church has given us an abundance of readings um, that can be used. So I've chosen two out of each section, the first and the third section. Um, so that, um, well, you can be a little bit ready for whatever you hear. Or uh, the priests, they could take their choice of these two. There are others that are mm, printed there for us, but I didn't comment on them. Uh, I will next year. All right. Well, the first one is from Genesis 11, 1 to 9. I'm going to start right with the readings and skip commentary and verbum domini uh, so that we have more space to do these uh, commentaries. Genesis 11, 1 to 9, uh, is about the Tower of Babel. Now, it's picked, why? Because the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost gathers all those scattered languages together again. And that's the reason. In other words, Pentecost is the solution to the division of uh, language and so forth. Mutual incomprehension uh, in the world. So the text goes like this. Uh, and, it all, and it so happened that all the world had the same language and the same words. And when they were migrating from the east, they came to a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. That's uh, like the Mesopotamian valley. Then they said to one another, Come, let us mold bricks and harden them with fire. They used bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. See, that strikes these people as strange. Because over in Palestine, uh, you don't have to worry about rocks. They're all over the place. And you build with rock and mortar. Here, they're building, as you see, they had to make the bricks and then bind them together with bitumen, kind of a tar. Um, it's so different, because if there's one thing you won't ever run out, run out of in Palestine, it's rocks. And people are so used to building that, then when you go to a construction site, and there's always a little house there where the men can have their lunch and where they store their tools, they're always made out of stone. And then they knock all the stones down, put them back in the truck, go to the next site and build a house again. So you see how different it is. It's just a small yard. So... Let us build us ourselves a city with its top in the sky and so make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered all over the earth. As you're going to see, this is a commentary on Babylon. The Lord, they're going to build this thing up to heaven. The Lord came down to see it. It was so high, he had to come down to see it. Uh, and the tower that the people had built. Then the Lord said, if now, well, they are one people and all have the same language, they have started to do this, nothing they presume to do will be out of their reach. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language, so that no one will understand the speech of another. Punishment for trying to start a world government, which is what this is all about, uh, is... Um, Mutual incomprehension. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the speech of all the world. From there the Lord scattered them over all the earth. Now, as with most narrative in the Hebrew Bible, this is uh, very artistically done. And so, 
I want to show you what's going on here. They want to make sure they're safe on their own terms. It's it's a actually it's sort of a, a diatribe against Babylonia. Bab El means gate of God, but in Hebrew it means Babel. Uh, in Arabic, Bab means like the, the gates around Jerusalem, in this wall of Jerusalem, or Bab this, Bab that, Bab that, uh, because of this uh, uh, word. So they're going to build Bab El, the gate to God. And uh, what they're really building is Babel. And so, uh, now why are they doing this? This, as I say, is a commentary on Babylonia. Babylonia was a mighty power, and it used its military power to secure economic suzerainty. It's what you might call the uh, Babel principle or the Babel principle. Governments have done this. Rome did it. The British and French did it. The Americans, not quite so harshly, uh, you know, use military might to secure economic advantage. Now, so they're going to build this with the tower up into the sky. And the word, of course, will, would be, uh, you see in the text, uh, come, let us build, uh, and, uh, there will be this place, uh, and, uh, and uh, it will be up to the sky. It will rival God. We won't need any other gods. We won't need anything. We will be Babel, the gate of God. That's the, you see, the, the, the story. Now, it's a popular story. Um, and it's a reflection and, and a criticism of the organized attempt to do without God. In its own way, it's a little world government. It's going to take over the world, run it all by its own rules and regulations, and they'll be at the top with their military power and their economic wealth. And God scatters it. Why? Because they couldn't understand each other. Now, if you look deeper, the lack of understanding is everybody has his own agenda. It's not just that they spoke the wrong different languages. So you can see what this story is all about. It's about human hebris, hubris. We are going to build a world on our own. My friends, that's where we are right now. This, in our era, this is a conscious, willed, and program to do without God. That's what it's all about. And the the uh, it goes back uh, to about the 14th century. This movement uh, started with the notion of knowledge, and when man decided that. Uh, we are the norm of reality. We determine what reality is, you see. And then that broke open a whole world of the scientific revolution. Herbert Butterfield, great uh, historian of science, says this scientific revolution actually is more earth-shaking and Europe-changing than the Reformation or anything else. And in a way it's true because it opened the way then for uh, this understanding that Newton was the one of the first, though he was a rather devout, sort of at least a deist, maybe a theist. But he said, I can't do it yet, but I can see that it is possible to express all the laws of the physical universe mathematically. That will give us control. That's physics. You see? And so, uh, from that point on, what happened was people began to, to use this method to get control over the material universe. 
When you do that, who needs God? When they discovered, you see, that the universe has an intrinsic intelligibility. You can manipulate this material universe for your own power, your own comfort. You can even make babies nowadays. You see? But they don't understand that this universe, while it has this intrinsic intelligibility, does not have an independent intelligibility. It depends for its intelligibility on God. And that, you see, so you find people saying, for instance, physicists, for instance, there's no such thing as metaphysics. And when you listen to the debates sometimes, how physicists uh, instinctively look to the physical universe to prove their theories. They can't go beyond them. And so they say, there is no metaphysics. But that itself is a metaphysical statement. It's a statement that goes beyond metaphysics, means beyond physics. So those statements, that there isn't any metaphysics, are statements that go beyond physics. You're stepping outside of physics and saying, there's nothing else. So you're already in metaphysics. Uh, but that movement, uh, you beautifully traced for us, for instance, by uh, Henri de Lubac, in his book, The Drama of Atheist Humanism, or uh, his name just slipped my mind. Uh, the, it's a book about the progress of modern thought. Dupre, Louis Dupre. Uh, they're both excellent in understanding this movement. Uh, and so, this story, you see, uh, is a story of human beings cutting off anything but physics or construction or however you want to look at it. And therefore, inevitably, they become scattered. They become unintelligible to each other because there's nothing bigger to hold them together. Uh, and that's why, uh, see, the story, their stories. Babel, Babylonia, is the gate of God. But you see, as I say, you see this in the empires that follow. You see it in the Roman Empire. You see it is in the colonial time as well. Uh, people went to another country, took it over, ruled it, and took its resources for themselves. And that's the same thing. World government. Now we're faced in a whole other way of consciously omit, eliminating God and striving to have this one world uh, based on resentment. We're going to fix this world. The problem is, my friends, that if you look closely, there's nothing but hatred and anger in concentrated on obliterating the world as we know it. There is no plan for rebuilding. And therefore, utopia becomes the excuse for eliminating millions of people. Mao Zedong, a hundred million, stood in his way to create a utopia. China is surely no utopia. Russia, same thing, communism. There, 20 million. Hitler, 10 million. All trying to eliminate the opposition to their utopia, which is founded on anger and resentment against God, whose existence they will not acknowledge. 